did a research report and it talked about the fast the fact that um, millennials and, and all the kind of groups underneath it were among the most entrepreneurial. And part of that had to do with their lack of kind of contentment with what they believe was this kind of go to work every day and come home every day circumstance of their parents. And so I think the youth is incredibly entrepreneurial. I, I think what we need to continue to do is keep tapping into them. And I think we're at this interesting next, at this interesting moment in time where we've always thought of mentorship as this kind of looking up vertical circumstance. I think we also need to be looking at mentorship from a horizontal and then also from a younger perspective. We ask the question jokingly, who's on TikTok? TikTok is the future, right? And so us not talking to our young kids, our, our nephews, our, our whomever, is creating a chasm between us and the next generation of how the next billion dollar business will be created. And so I think there's value in the wisdom that we have and there's excitement in the enthusiasm that they have on what's coming next. But we need to tap into that. Just even talking about you know, our African diasporatic, our, our diaspora, uh, our, our pan-Africanism, you know, partnership, nobody wins, as Jay-Z said, when the family feuds. And so when we're not collectivized, when we're not together, when we're not partnering, when we're not talking to each other, you know, just in the back I was saying, men need to go to brunch. Women talk about their dreams and goals, put their little dream goal books together all the time. Whether it's breakfast, lunch, or cigars, whatever you're doing, business meetings is what we're talking about. Because that's what women are doing. I see the women saying, yeah, girl, I go to brunch, and we're having our dream conversations there. I want to ask the men to do the same thing and bring a young man with you. I'm going to close by just saying this. Because it was my responsibility as the highest ranking black woman at the Small Business Administration appointed under the Biden-Harris administration to come in and do something with this position, not just to sit pretty in it, but to do something with it. I can do both. Was. Thanks. <laughs> was. We tripled the number of HBCUs that we funded to put women's business centers on the campus of. We have tripled the number of schools that we are partnering with for new entrepreneurial inc uh, uh, ecosystems and incubators on HBCU campuses. Because this again, conferences like the Clay, where you all are sitting toe, neck and neck with the future. You're sitting with, you You have your lineage. We have a new whole new lineage. I pledge Alpha Chapter Delta, so I know. I go back on campus and it's like, wow, this is the future of the chapter. Talk to them and find out what they're thinking about because your money, your relationships, and their enthusiasm can be the next Mark Zuckerberg because that's what he had. Mm. All right now. Okay, where you at? Uh, it's quite simple. One, uh, you are going to get old and die. Uh, just, I mean, one day, okay? So there is no success without succession. That is a comedic, ancient Egyptian way of life for black people. That is a historical, communicable way of lifting up the next generation. And whenever I go into a meeting and I just see a certain age group and no young people in that meeting, I know that organization is misguided. Mm. Because somebody helped you get to where you needed to get to. Yes, somebody gave you a hand up, a leg up, and even a push up to where you are currently today. Am I right, Rick? So when we think about the next generation of entrepreneurship, if you go in the classroom, you say, would you want to go work for someone else or do you want to own your own business? 98% of that classroom is going to raise their, their hand and they're going to say, we want to own our own business. And even if we work for somebody else, we are going to train and learn and then go out and form our own business. So at the end of the day, economic independence shouldn't be third or fourth on your list it should be the core and the center. If you know Booker T. Washington, the reason why he formed the National Negro Business League post-slavery was for the economic centrality, liberation, and independence of black people. He said, forget the political, forget the social, forget the status, and forget the education because the economics should be the core to all of those tentacles. If you don't have an economic base, in the economic core, then just like they say in politics, running for office without money is a pipe dream, or it's like marriage without love. Mm. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah.
know, you know, listening to Kim made me think of something else, and this is personal. Um, and I've been sharing it. You know, my father passed in April. And one of the things that it really made me realize when, when Kim was talking about the fact that we are all gonna die, it's inevitable. We came in and we're gonna go, is estate planning and how critical it is for you all to have your will. I mean, I don't I, I don't care if you don't wanna talk about it. You gotta talk about it. We gonna die, you gonna die. Just deal with it, it's gonna happen. And having your stuff in order is so helpful for your sanity, for your uh, successors, for your children, for the generations that come after you. What good is all of this that we are doing if when you pass, everybody is feuding over what you created? Whether it be $5 or $500,000 in the bank, you should have your stuff in order. No one in this room should not have life insurance. No one in this room should not have to have a will. Yeah, the bros got lawyers, the bros got financiers, y'all got everything. So we, again, when we're in these meetings and we're at Wells Fargo, this is where we need to be going to talk to folks about the entire spectrum of wealth planning. It's not just a small business loan, it's a, if you pass, what happens to the small business and the money that you made in the wealth transfer mechanism, or is it just gonna be sitting held up in a bank for decades because the family is feuding on how to release the funds? Mm, and then yeah. the last thing I'll say is I was at the U.S. Black Chamber two weeks ago, and Will, uh, oh God, was this, Will Copeland, Will Moreland, he got on stage and he talked about the fact that he grew up in Compton, and he lost his family, he had 20 people in his family. They lost their, fa their family home over 2,500 dollars. That home was purchased for $75,000 and paid off. And today it's worth almost $900,000. And they lost it. 20 grown adults. Over $2,500. Because we're not having the conversations. We're not having the meetings. We want to have a barbecue and not have a business talk. We need to be talking about all of it. We don't want to talk to the ex-wife, ex-husband. We need to be talking to everybody. We don't want to talk to mom, to dad. We don't want to talk to sisters, to brothers. Nobody wins when the family feuds. Amen. Amen. Wow, give it up, y'all, for Natalie Cofield and Dr. Ken Harris.